everyone out there running fans track fans throwing jumping overall athletic fans welcome to the talking in ovals podcast thank you so much for being here on this monday october 3rd of 2022 before we get into anything fun give us a like share follow subscribe rate us five stars on spotify and itunes spread this word of mouth and unfortunately i have some sad news for the astute listeners Uh, Dave is not uh, able to be with us. Coach Hyatt, he had something pop up. So he told me that he wasn't going to be able to be here. But fortunately, I'm used to doing this type of stuff. I've interviewed a lot of people before, so I'm pretty good to hold down shop. And I think today is going to be a show that everyone that likes the sport of running that's ever coached before is going to really love. I am happy to have with me Jonathan J. Marcus. He's an overall coach and the co-host of On Coaching Podcast. So if you get the hint there, he likes to coach. How's it going, Jonathan? Doing awesome. Now I hear that badass intro. Jeez, I got to sell Magnus. We got up our game. That was the most kick-ass intro I've ever heard. Kudos on that. <laughs> I appreciate that. I appreciate it so much. So yeah, we're going to have a good time here because I've coached before, which I mentioned on the podcast. Hyatt has talked about coaching before. We actually had one of our former athletes on last week's show, Janae Valman. So please go back and give that a listen. But you know, we just, we eat, sleep, and breathe the sport. We love coaching. You know, funny enough, Jonathan, I just got a random phone call today from one of my former athletes that I coached over at Maris College. Right now, he's, you know, married, married another one of my athletes from Marist, has a few kids down in Florida. And you could probably attest to this. We just talked. We talked nothing about running. We just talked and saw how everything was. And I think that's one of the biggest perks of being a coach outside seeing the athlete success especially when it comes to running or kind of these individual grueling sports, just the relationships you build with the athletes. So before we get into any of the real coaching grind, you know, what do you, what do you say about that? Just kind of the relationship building and how, you know, how many athletes do you now just keep in touch with just because? Oh, I mean, a good amount. Um, you know, I, I view coaches as kind of like uh, mentors or, you know, if you're a Lord of the Rings nerd, you're basically Gandalf to the hobbits. And like, it doesn't matter what age you intersect with that athlete, whether they're on the beginning of their development pathway in athletics or towards the end of that uh, trajectory, it's you're there to point them in the right direction. And that's our fundamentally first and foremost, that's the job, just giving them good orientation, good sound guidance and advice, but ultimately laying either the foundation or giving them the opportunity to spread their wings and fly and be independent. And that's the most beautiful thing is to see athletes grow up, mature, maybe step away from the competitive side of the sport, but still play uh, the sport because they have a love of the play, of the passion for it, not necessarily because they're out there trying to play to win anymore. And, yeah, I mean, can't tell you how many times I just intersect with um, former athletes years later and talk nothing of running but just catch up on life and just warms my heart to see the beautiful people they become. It's it's kind of the beauty of it. So, uh, you know, you spoke about, you know, the love of the sport, the passion of the sport. Now, in order to be a coach, I feel like sometimes even more than an athlete, you really have to have a passion for that sport because, you know, especially if most coaches of runners are former runners and they ran at a pretty high level. So it's kind of first the gut punch of I'm not them anymore, but now I can at least try and pass on what I tried to do better and kind of get them there. So we all have our own coaching philosophy. There is some coaches that are much harder. There are some coaches that are a lot lighter, that like long distance, less distance, that push the envelope a little more in terms of what's legal, what's not legal. So everyone's different. I want you to kind of break down what is your kind of general overall coaching philosophy when you're just getting athlete a that you honestly don't know much about yet maybe outside of looking at some results maybe talking to a former coach or a parent or something like that what's your overall coaching philosophy when it comes to dealing with an athlete i mean first and foremost i try to calibrate what game are we playing you know i understood before like you can play the game to play the game for the love of the play or you can uh play the game and you're playing to win so either you're playing to play or you're playing to win 
And then sometimes you get that funner section where you're playing to play and playing to win concurrently. And that's really, really a lot of fun. So again, it's all contextualized based off what the athlete is wanting and where they're at in their journey. So a good example of this is I worked for many years with the uh, national record holder for Mexico in the one mile, Daniel Herrera. And when I was working with him, he was an elite national caliber athlete and he was playing a game to win. Like he's concerned about making money, winning races, getting times, advancing. That was the orientation. That's what preparation, that's what all dialogue and conversation center around. He recently got into Harvard grad school and taking a break for last year. And now he's kind of like, you know, doing some workouts and just texting me the workouts he's doing for fun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm like, all right, just make sure you have an appetite, have fun with it. And then, you know, I'm like, all right, well, at first I'm like, you know, you plan to play or you plan to win. You also plan to play. Go keep having fun. And then he hits me with a text of like, boom, 147, whatever indoor <laughs> um, record for Mexico in the 800. He said, I think I'm hungry. I go, oh, so now we're playing to win. <laughs> so it changes the context of the relationship based once you establish what uh, the ground rules are or the orientation of the athlete is. A lot of times there's this mismatch that happens where the coach might be playing to win, but the athlete's playing to play or vice versa. And that's where friction happens. So I try to avoid that by like clearly uh, uh, orienting myself and the athlete and the athlete support team, whether it be parents, family, friends, what have you into that context of what are we doing? And then from there, that's the direction we go and, um, you know, develop the relationship through. Have you ever found yourself when you're coaching an athlete and, you know, maybe they come in and they say, uh, you know, coach markets, I'm, I'm here to work. I want to, I want to get better. I want to win. I want to be the best wherever I am in my college, in my high school, in the pros. And then all of a sudden something switches off as you're doing that hard training that maybe they realize maybe this is a little more than they can handle. And it's something that's hard for athletes to realize. Have you kind of seen when that switch occurs? Cause I think it, you know, sometimes the athletes can't see it and coaches can, and also, have you gotten yourself in that situation where you kind of find yourself, you know, coaching a little bit harder to try and get them there, but then it's not happening? Like, have you been in those situations? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, but my, um, you know, default is to be blunt, transparent, and honest to a fault. So I just uh, remind the athlete, the orientation and calibration and saying, hey, you are, you know, drifting off course here and I can't make the decision. Like I, I can only lead you to water, can't make you drink, but it's keeping that sharp, um, um, you know, standard about why we're here. And I think, you know, a lot of times what ends up happening, especially now more than ever, is we live in kind of what I call fantasy land, where we've been sold these manufactured fairy tale narratives from forever and early on and continually bombard with them. And we forget that hard things are hard because they're hard. Yeah, and we forget this all the time. It's just reminding ourselves, like, there's a reason not a lot of people are doing this. Yep. There's a reason there's not this line of people out the door running this time, you know, coming to this race in this championship, ready, rocking and rolling to go. There's a reason because it's really freaking hard. And that's okay. That's how we actually um, learn the most of ourselves is through doing hard things. But unfortunately, like we by digesting all those fairy tales and narr and fantasy narratives, we end up, um, what I've seen is we set our horizons often very low. And so in a lot of ways, the coach is a vehicle, if you will, and a source to help elevate someone's gaze on the horizon just a little higher towards the peak rather than like keeping that head down, you know, towards the valley. <laughs> Yeah, you would have really liked my coaches over at Marist College, Pete Colizo and Chuck Williams, because they were very similar. They were not going to. They were dealing with grown men and women in college, and they were not going to sugarcoat it. They, you yeah. know, if, if things weren't going the way that they were supposed to go, they'd be saying, hey, you're off course here. Is it, you, you know where you need to be. We talked about your plans this year. You're not hitting them right now, and we need to get you there. And when I coached over at Marist, I coached under uh, Coach Colizo for two years, paid two years volunteer. And one of the things I used to tell my athletes, I was more involved of the sprints and a little bit of long sprints. And I would say to the Marist College, we're a small school. We're not producing a lot of national champions or even nationally competitive individuals, maybe regionally, but you know, we have pride in what we do. But I would tell all my sprinters, and I don't know if you had the same mentality. If you're not here in college, 
to win a national championship as a division one runner, if that's not your goal, then you're kind of wasting your time a little bit here because I want to train you to become a national champion. Is that feasible for a lot of you? Maybe not. But if you're not trying to train that way in division one, then what are you kind of doing? And I think it kind of goes back to your philosophy. Are you here to say you're a division one athlete or are you you here to compete like a division one athlete type of deal? So, you know, I, I don't know if you kind of walk in that same mindset of if you're telling me you're hungry and you're here to go, then we got to reach and com- train for your goal the whole exact the whole entire time. Yeah, I, Alex, I really appreciate that mindset. Um, you know, I'm a West Coast guy who went to an East Coast school because I loved the East Coast mentality. So different from the West Coast, like yeah. much more hard nose, nose to the grindstone, like forget about it. We're going to do this thing. You knew where you still with East Coast people, West Coast yeah. people. Eh. <laughs> so but uh, when it comes to winning, you know, I think that's the, the, the great misunderstood point is the thing I love about track and field and athletics or individualized um, sports that have a collective team point or can have a collective team point total is j- there is, yes, an absolute victor of the contest for sure and that is something everyone should and can aspire to but it's not something that everyone can and should actually grasp because it takes a lot to get to the top yeah you know it's only at the top for reason and what track and field and uh running lends itself to is a lot of victories in the same race and when i say play the win it doesn't necessarily mean like you know hit the peak let's get to mount everest for some athletes it's like let's just get to base camp yeah because where you're starting off is you're a walk-on freshman who you know is you can't can't tell your nose from a hole in the ground walking backwards and if we can get you to be a conference all conference athlete by the time you're a senior huge victory huge Mm -hmm. and so that's what we have to remember is there's always micro races within the macro race. And that's where as coaches, I think we have to um, elevate athletes to always look towards achieving something that we see is capable and within them that they have the potential to, and maybe they don't yet understand they're capable of, but helping them ascend to that, that peak for them. It's almost like, you know, what's more exciting as a coach, watching that athlete break that PR in a milestone time, like your 5k guy going for sub 15 for the first time, or watching that really fast athlete win the conference in a more, you know, not their best time, but an extremely tactical race and having success in your game plan. Like, I don't know what's almost more exciting there because I feel like in, like you said, in the world of running, uh, the winner isn't the only winner. There is a ton of winners throughout that race. And especially, so it, it's such an interesting sport in that sense. And I want to ask you a little something. Um, me and Coach Hyatt over here, we always, always, always rag on the track and field meet coverage when it comes to like NBC and things like that. Now, we've loved what they've done with the Diamond League on Peacock, where they give you the world feed and you get to kind of just see the meet as the meet. But then when they put it on NBC, they put all these fluff pieces. They put all these background stories. You don't really watch the 5Ks. You don't really see the field events outside of a few jumps and stuff here. Is that kind of adding to this fantasy land that you kind of talked about with some of our athletes where if they're not seeking the Peacock feed and they're not watching the world feed, they're not watching all of our other amazing athletes there, that they're kind of only being fed your... Sydney McLaughlin, you're a thing, Mo, you're, you know, uh, Noah Lyles. And, you know, it's great to highlight those athletes and it's great to aspire to be them. But I think there's some value in seeing, you know, another athlete from another country getting a national record in a race where they got fifth. It's like something beautiful there. So do you think kind of the coverage of track and field, specifically in America, kind of lends itself to that fantasy world that we're seeing right now? Uh, it's definitely noise, um, I would say, you know, rather than signal, right? And, but yeah. it does send a message. It sends a message. It says, this is what we're going to pay attention to. We have these multi-million dollar operation here. We're going to focus on this because we feel this is our best return on investment for the audience that we are trying to cater to. You know, I think those large national broadcasts are designed to initially attract the non-track and field fan to track and field. So that's why you see the fluff puff pieces or the, you know, only highlighting the big dogs who are running, you know, absolute world-class times or records. And the key is the funnel. 
right? So once you've been attracted into the sport, well, where's the next step to become a little bit more quote unquote hardcore? And, but it doesn't exist really unless you kind of navigate through this really awkward stream of you have to find new clicks. Yeah. It's like yeah. it's super, super tough. So it's like, I've always thought about this as myself, as a coach, it's like, I could probably make a lot more dollars just writing generic programming for your average fluff intro runner who just wants some kind of direction. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I keep a sharp standard. I'm like, no, I'm here for really two things. Like when you talked about what was more exciting, someone, you know, winning a meet, a conference meet title or someone setting a PR, it's like, well, for me, there's two things that are really exciting. I try to really get those turning points, um, develop an athlete through the crucible of training and then magnify it through the crucible and education process that's racing. And the first one, again, part of my French is giving a fuck. Like if I see that and you give an F, like, that's awesome. Like you're coming down the home stretch, someone past you and you know you had to dig as deep as possible and you just gave an f and you went for it and maybe you didn't actually beat and out kick that person who passed you or maybe you passed them back and they passed you back and what have you but you showed some spunk you gave an f and then the, you know it closely correlated with that was not punking out don't punk out like oh, yeah. mike smith is a good friend of mine uh you know he has a no punk out rule mm -hmm. that I have stolen and it's um because it's, it's just great verbiage around it. it's like so often we punk out when it gets hard so often we punk out when the tribulations are there you got an injury oh i'm just not going to come to practice for like six weeks because i'm injured it's like that's the most important time to come to practice and stay connected emotionally with your yep. peers or you know i'm not going to do the little things and they're the add up to big results like sleep and adequate, you know, hydration and keep my nutrition on point. And so all these things I'm constantly assessing because if you um, give an F and you don't punk out, then that creates more excitement in me as a coach to then want to work with you. But again, as far as like how we attract globally fans in the sport, it is about Telling stories, it has to be because we are hardwired for narratives, but it's also making sure we have avenues for the more in-depth niche narratives rather than just the big front page narratives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so you know a lot of people in the sport, obviously. Um, find somebody with a big pocket for me, and we need to start handing out contracts to some of these talented athletes. If we want to keep people in, me and Coach Haya talk about the ATL often, um, what they're trying to do with the American yeah. Track League. And we think it's a good idea. ESPN has been airing the meets. But it's kind of every other league that we found that I'm a broken record if you listen to this podcast. So I'm sorry for saying it again. But every other league that we find, they can promote their athletes because you know who's going to be there. The PGA, even the LIV right now, it's an individual sport. You know who's going to be at these events. They promote them. They're contracted essentially to them. Um, UFC, big time. You know who's going to be in that octagon. They tell you for a month away. We have no idea essentially who's going to be at these meets. You know, there's talented individuals that are racing in the ATL. Yes, they're not your, your big time elite world champions, but they're running really fast world class caliber times. But there's no promotion. No one knows who's going to be there. There isn't a little kid that's clamoring to turn this on ESPN because their favorite runner is there. There is no such thing outside of the big names. So I love what they're doing. But if you know anybody with the deep pocket in the sport, Tell them to, to how many runners do you know if they said we'll pay you 75k to show up at these six meets? I'm telling you, there's a lot of runners that'll be like, Yes, I will do it for like a hundred thousand. Just give me six meets, a hundred thousand. That's all I have to do. Train for these six so my name can be on a promo. I'm in. Like, it doesn't even have to be the millions of dollars. But if America latches onto track and field, this is a huge huge group that can make a ton of money. And I think we need some rich people to notice that to get these people on the maps. <laughs> yeah. I mean, promotion is definitely asked backwards in America for the sport. We have a very amateurish mindset still about the infrastructure of yes. meets and how we run it. And I mean, you know, there's very simple um, examples we could take, even like the regional um, wrestling circuit that existed in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. you know, before WWF, like bought them all out and, you know, kind of like pigeonholed the market. Yeah. But again, it's, it really comes down to, you know, and I myself have been a meat director for a lot of these boutique meats, um, you know, that have started up like, you know, the Sunset Tour. Jesse and I were the original um, founders and collaborators of it. 
Um, you know, I ended up not following through with it just because I was kind of burnt out after having put on all these other meats, uh, you know, and he was just like looking at his chops. So he's ran with it and did a lot of good stuff, which is yeah. exciting to see. But at the end of the day, you know, you need a little bit more hands on deck because you need someone to orchestrate behind the scenes and set the thing up, which is often what the job of a meat director is. Yeah. And then you also need the promoter, the person who goes out, shakes the hands, passes out the tickets, rings the doorbells, gets the ads, you know, puts the flyers up, radio, you know, spots, etc. And oftentimes what ends up happening is it, these are skeleton crews who are pulling off these like kind of world-class meets, even within yeah. the U.S., and that's just one line item that kind of gets forgotten because there's so many different, I could tell you story after story, we could take out like two days of a podcast here. We'll have you on again. Last we could just talk about fires. horror stories of running a meet. Oh my gosh. Last second <laughs> fires and worries and spending eight hours to try to find a, you know, 10K female rabbit for Shalane Flanagan because all of a sudden she decides she want to go run. And it's like, well, F word, Shalane, there's not that many women who can run 5K at your 10K pace out there who are just hanging out. So, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is there nobody on your team available? Oh, they're all racing for PRs as well. Well, you're so, kind of... <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, but, you know, and those are the, the realities behind the scenes that no one sees. Yeah. Um but yeah, we definitely have a, a lack, a fundamental lack of professionalism and what it means to be professional. And yeah, Paul is doing a great job. Like, you know, with the ATL, it's phenomenal. Yeah. But again, he's a skeleton crew. He's a skeleton mm -hmm. operator. It's, it's amazing what Doyle has been able to accomplish, um, you know, just on his own and with his connections and, you know, with a couple answerly bodies and um, passionate volunteers helping him. So, yeah, if you're anybody out there running fan, if you hear the ATLs coming into your area, please. And if you have any experience in the, you know, meat area, please go help out. Let's make this bigger. And if you are going there, tell them you want to help promote it as well. Find out who the, you know, the sheet is of athletes committed to coming. Start promoting those athletes right away. It's the only way you can help grow the sport is if people know who's going to be there and people can look forward to it. Yeah, so, you're, you're Alex, you're right. You got to get involved. If you're going to sit on the sidelines and bitch, it's not working. Like when I got out of college, I immediately got involved in USATF and mm -hmm. my association level, national level, I became an official. I am an official. I officiate meets. I do everything. I'm a coach. Like, it's like, if you really want to make it better, like put your money where your mouth is, show up and go make it better. It's easy to post a, you know, cryptic or, uh, you know, I sideways tweet or Instagram post like, blah, 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 blah. It's like, dude, are you actually in the trenches? Because if you're not in the arena, like sit down and shut up. <laughs> it's kind of the goal of this podcast is to raise the awareness more. So I feel like I'm doing my little bit of part. I could probably be more active in the road running scene and stuff, but that's kind of the goal for me and Hyatt was to kind of raise the awareness of the sport that we love by having people like you and such on and kind of highlighting more athletes. So if you have any athletes that want to come on that you know, we'd love to have anybody on because I don't think track athletes get enough credit for the hard work that they do. And I feel like more of them need to be interviewed and talk about. So let's jump back into coaching philosophy, though, because I like that aside. That was a perfect aside, though. So let's talk about you. You know, you've coached, like you said, you've coached anywhere from young athletes in the middle school level up to the, you know, elites, the seniors that are running in pen relay, setting records in the senior races, right? What is your challenge in keeping an athlete from overworking? Because a lot of the times if people are working with you to win, they want to work and they want to go hard. But I found that as a coach, sometimes it's you almost understanding the limits of the athletes a little better than they do because you're watching them. You're seeing their body language change. You're seeing their form start to break a little bit earlier in practice on a workout you know it shouldn't be happening in. What is your challenge there? And how do you kind of get that across to athletes? Say like, hey, we have to tone it down a little. There's a method to my madness. Trust me here. Like, how do you go about that? Well, when you're playing the game to win, what ends up happening is most people have a really warped view about uh, what it is they're really doing when they're training, right? The truth is, like, initially, when you start training or when you're training to play the game to win, the first order of business is to really play the game to stop losing. But, the, you know, and this is, it kind of hurts people ahead um, understanding this. There's a excellent book, old book called The Extraordinary uh, Extraordinary Terrace for the Ordinary Player. It was written by a um, physicist that had a, a love for tennis. And what he noticed was as a scientific point of view, he's like, all amateur players suck in the same way 
because they're trying to emulate the top tier players who are so good that they can actually get a serve and put the spin on it and like fake out their opponent. That's not the amateur player. The amateur player needs to stop making double defaults. They need to stop hitting the ball in the net. They need to stop playing and they need to stop losing. And so what's happening is, you know, we have this view of winning and we think it's just about doing hard work, no guts, no glory, this and that. So you really have to recalibrate expectations and reality. And until someone has the humility to come to terms with the only path to winning is to first stop losing, that is that is number one. Otherwise, it's going to be like a syphysis situation, right? You're forever pushing this boulder up a hill only to have it roll back down and having little or no traction made. And so when we talk about hard work, what end up happening in the distance world, it's very interesting we have this very mechanical view of training as a only cardiorespiratory um, purpose. And we know now with mitochondria development and all this stuff, that that is one avenue actually to develop mitochondria, biogenesis, efficacy, and density. There's other enzyme signalings that can be achieved through what we call essentially high interval or high intensity interval training, HIT training. Yep. It all comes down to is the heart pumping really hard for a period of time? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you can do it for short periods of time and move a lot of gallons of blood through a very short period of time with HIIT training, or you can do it at a kind of moderate-ish level for sustained longer periods of times and get the same benefit. The beauty of Mother Nature is it's our job to understand her and not to take this like, you know, that what we typically do, which is a viewer's worldview of the situation, like we did with like the sun. We go, oh, we're here on earth. So every the sun must revolve around us, or we open the body and look at this cadaver that is, de- um, you know, uh, that is dissected, yeah. and we say, oh, here's a hamstring, here's a glute, here's this, and it's like, no, 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 it's all to to the brain and the body. It's one unitary whole. There's no division, dude. Yep. But until we can adopt that posture, you're going to have these people who are going to be very metric oriented who are going to be like, I need to work hard, the most miles, the most hard stuff, the most, the most, more is better mentality. And it's like, we need to just talk about your mechanics. You want, you want to go run 100 miles a week? We need to talk about how you're breathing yeah. and how you're moving. Because if your job, if you're saying like, you need to increase your oxygen uptake or VO2 max or what have you, and you don't know how to breathe correctly, and you have like an overly kyphotic posture where you are hunched over and you don't get that broad shoulders, which is mm. why we run so well is with these broad, long shoulders. Like, yeah, we you're going to have troubles. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I always found the battle is like when, when our individuals get tired, especially distance runners, it's like, okay, it's easy to have good form early. But when you're on that, you know, you're running a hard, a hard long run. You're going in for an eight, 10 mile run. It's going to be pretty high up tempo. What are your last four, three miles? Are you now bringing your arms high across your body? Are your shoulders tense? Are you leaning forward at that point? It's like, okay, you did the mile, but did you do it well? What did you get out of that finishing? What did you get out of that last part of your miles? And one thing I always used to like to tell any difficult athletes is I used to like to look at them and go, so you're the athlete, right? Yeah. Do you know everything about this sport? No. Who am I? You're the coach. Okay. Do I know a little more than you? Yeah, I think so. Okay, then why don't you try listening to me? Like, it's one of those, and it's like kind of the aha moment of, okay, maybe maybe they have a point. <laughs> so, yeah, I completely, I completely agree with that, that it's kind of like, if you can get them to buy into the fact that everything else outside of what they think is important is actually important, right? Because I know you're big on outside of just the running aspect. Oh yeah. You're big on sleep, what you eat, what you do during the day when you're not running, what are you doing? Are you going out and playing basketball? Okay. Now then you're affecting your future workouts. Like you're doing something different. You should be incorporating what you're doing into your training in some sort of way. So I know you're very big on that. So kind of, you like to touch on that stuff, kind of speak a little more to kind of the outside influences and how that can affect training as well. Yeah, I mean, really astute observation, Alex. Like I, uh, you know, paraphrase it very succinctly as make the miles count, don't count the miles. And that's often what people do because counting is easy. And you say, oh, hey, good job, little monkey. I got these many miles in a day. I must be getting better because I, it was hard. I worked out. Yeah. 
but in uh, you know Russian literature, in Soviet literature, they have a saying. It's like there's no such thing as a workout. The workout, the concept workout of being sweaty, hot, and tired doesn't exist. Every training session is actually a lesson. It's mm-hmm. a teaching situation, a learning situation. It's a sensei and pupil situation. So. You know, when someone comes with to me with aspirations of greatness or wanting to play the game to win, first and foremost is a conversation about, all right, what is your sleep and eating habits? And are those in harmony with where you want to end up here in six months, six years, however long we're going to work together? And most people are shocked because they just want to talk about programming. They just want to talk about like, well, how many miles out a week? What do the workouts look like, coach? You know, what are the long runs, these things? Because we hear about all these ingredients, but the fundamental foundation of training, of exercise in the human body actually is nutrient delivery and waste removal. Yep. So if you don't have preloaded high nutrient load in your bloodstream before you work out, and then you don't have the efficacy and the capacity to then create very rapidly that waste removal because you're overly sympathetic and now your system's on overdrive and it won't shut off. So you can't absorb nutrients. You can't let go of nutrients. You're too stiff and rigid and tight and tense. And you have this excessive oscillation effect in the muscles because they're not relaxing when they should. You, we can talk about how many miles you aspire to run a week, want to run a week, but you're essentially driving a car down the road with two deflated tires. The you know, suspension's all you know jacked up, and the steering wheel is always cutting sharp to the right. Plus, two windows are broken, and you won't talk about you want to drive this car across country. It's like, come on, man. <laughs> so have you ever found yourself meeting with the new athletes, sitting across from them, kind of going over your whole entire like pre-observation, I guess, of the athlete, kind of trying to jive with them? And have you ever found that your philosophy just does not fit with what that athlete wants to do in that athlete's philosophy? And have you ever kind of turned an athlete down in a sense, if they're not going to conform? Like, have you come to that where an elite athlete just refuses to conform and doesn't believe in what you're doing, or you know that they don't believe in it? Have you come to that point where you're like, hey, I don't think this is going to work out and I don't want to waste either of our time. Like, have you been in that situation? Oh, shit. Yeah, dude. I mean, you know, <laughs> I stopped coaching elite national caliber men and women who you would think like any coach would just be like, oh, it's a godsend. I'm working with them. They're going to make me look so good because I realized we just got to an impasse where it's like I understood the direction for their development was left and they thought the direction for their development was right. And it's like, you know, at the end of the day, like for better or worse, the person like when you're dealing with adults, the athlete is always right. And when you're dealing with children, the parents are always right. Like <laughs> yeah. you can't, you can't, you can't separate, se- sever that, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of influencing that needs to go on as a coach. But yeah, I mean, often nowadays, right, when I get a prospective new client, I actually try to talk them out of it a lot because I really don't want to work with someone if the commitment level is not there. And a lot of people like the idea of training or like might want to be coached for me for whatever reason. But like, I'm like, dude, if you're not in for at least a three month minimum and really a six month minimum, we can't even get started. We're just getting started in the first half a year. Right. That's the reality of the situation. It's a little easier at this classic level. Right. Cause like kids aren't going anywhere in school. So might as well. Um, <laughs> but when we're working with adult clients, a leader, even like non elite, right. Just, you know, general gen pop athletes. It, I, f- I found myself, yeah, turning down more people or them turning me down because I communicated the gravity of what it was really going to take to get to what they wanted to go. When what they wanted to hear was just, I have magic workouts. And if you do my magic workouts, you're going to get better. Trust me when it's unfortunately not that simple. We wish it was, but it's another fairy tale or running half truth that is like, you know, promoted to this day by essentially charlatans, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, there is no, and that's the thing too. Like you could put your best effort in and you could put them in the best direction possible and they can give their best honest effort. But sometimes things just don't jive. And that's especially in, you know, running an individualistic sports because there are certain styles and there are certain things that just don't happen or it doesn't happen at the level that people want it to. And it's almost, there's times where it's nobody's fault. And, you know, you're both giving it your best. You both put your best feet forward and, uh, you know, no pun intended there, but that's quite literally what happens. And it's unfortunate, but I mean, I'd hope that some of the athletes are 
amicable enough to see that when that's, you know, obviously you've coached a lot of athletes, so you've probably fallen into that situation. Um, how often are athletes kind of frustrated or annoyed with you or give the blame on you as a coach? And if you're a coach in this situation and you know you did everything you could and the athlete did everything they could and it happens that way, what's kind of your advice to some other coaches that maybe are pretty new at this or falling into the situation for the first time where you both gave the best effort, athlete and coach, and it just didn't work out. Now the athlete's kind of pissed in your direction. How, how do you handle that? Oh, I sit down, I go, like, just go, man. All right, man. Today's a shit on coach Marcus day. Just shit on me, man. I'm not, I go up front. I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to get defensive. I'm going to just listen. No rebuttals, no nothing. I want you just to, you you have an open forum shit on me everything and anything that you ain't feeling that you're not liking because i need to hear it from the horse's mouth direct and i'm not going to hold it against you it's not going to change my you know opinion of you you know and like after that the goal is to see okay can we come to you know an amicable and a, you know adult understanding and continue the professional working relationship or is it just to a point where it's like people sometimes people just get fed up and they don't want to look in the mirror. So they look towards the next closest thing, which checks to be the coach place the blame there and then just say, okay, I need to move on to a new chapter. Right. And that's totally, that's part of the process too. Right. I mean, you're dealing with people and people are really complex, but as long as you as an individual and professional are showing up with the best intent every day, like, you know, I hear this all the time, like co- athletes will like blame coaches for being lazy or not caring and go, look, that's only true if that coach never got excited about a PR. If that coach never got excited for you about a breakthrough race, if that coach never like called your name or, you know, gave you time of their attention, then yes, they sucked as a coach. But if that doesn't happen, like they did give a shit, they cared, you know, and, and cause that's how we show that in the coaching athlete community and relationship is getting excitement for these milestones that might happen. Right. Yeah. And you know, we, we, it's, so it's even recalibrating other athletes to see that. And part of it, when you're in a position of service, which essentially is a coaching, the coaching role, because you are guiding someone else on their journey. So you are like Gandalf, you're leading the way for them, but they don't have to take that path. They might want to go under, you know, in the mines and face the deep dark rather than go around the mountain, like you told them. And you have to deal with it, right? So that humility and that service mindset is key when you're coaching. So you have to understand, you have to check your ego at the door a lot of times, and you have to be able to to hear the hard things you don't want to hear and then not get upset or offended by them as well. So I have to ask you this because I'd be remiss that if I have an elite coach in front of me who coach elite athletes to not kind of ask about the Alberto Salazar situation. Now, that's a, that guy was a part of your fraternity for a long time as a coach because coaches are a fraternity. Um, you know, a lot of coaches are very close, even though we're competitive in terms of athletes and stuff with each other. We are still close. You know, um, we like to see each other succeed. Obviously, we want our athletes to succeed. But when one coach in the running community is succeeding, it kind of feels good for everyone. We're doing something right. And there's bits and pieces we could take from each other. When that a whole situation came down. Um, you don't have to opine too much because I don't know how much you want to go into it, but kind of what were your emotions and kind of, did you kind of know something already being in the community? Like what kind of the firestorm with the Alberto Salazar situation? I mean, Alberto is a mentor of mine, you know, for better or worse. Right. And like, you have to count all your mentors equally um, no matter how history ends up um, judging them. Right. Mm-hmm. And the judgment was definitely fair. hundred percent. You know, the, um, the, the thing is, is it's always tough. People are multifactorial, multidimensional. And I've seen the, the very, a very good side of Alberto. And I've also seen a very vicious side. Uh, you know, what ended up being his doubt, his personal downfall was a, you know, overwhelming desire to win and have certainty surrounding win, winning. So, you know, winning at all costs, as we call it, where you need to create certainty that victory will play out in your favor. Unfortunately, that's not life and that's not sport. You do all this preparation and training and there is always going to be a, an air of luck to it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so that insecurity that corroded and eroded his 
um, you know, his mind essentially and his demeanor. Plus, with unchecked resources and power being essentially as, you know, for all intents and purposes, the number two person at Nike and having, you know, the, the Nike uh, piggy bank at his disposal, you know, and beck and call, that also can, power does corrupt. It really does. Because when you um, have access to that type of resources, you know, the thing is, is, you get a warp view because not many people do. So you don't, you're not grounded anymore. Right. So I always try to stay grounded myself. I mean, I learned a ton from him that was positive. And I also learned a ton that was negative, but I free framed as positive because it's like, don't do this. Don't mm -hmm. do that. Don't do this. Right. So yeah. And that, I mean, again, it's good and it's valid, you know, what the judgment was and what came down because it was a long time coming to be frank. You know, a lot of people were like, why is this taking so long? But I'm glad they had an air tight, air tight and shut case on it so everyone can move forward. Um, but like I said, a lot of people in the sport in some ways owe him a debt of gratitude as well as also casting him out and shunning him for all the very nasty things he did as well. So it's it's a tough tough thing because there's a lot going on there but like i said it's um you know it's all at the end of the day it's just disappointing because you would have hoped he could have used his position and the vehicles he had at his disposal for 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 good rather than for the corroded and corrupt ill he chose <laughs> And I think your view is important because, uh, you know, there's very rare just with anything in our planet right now that we have nuance, right? Nuance is not something that we find uh, very often in any arena at all, especially in American um, conversations and narratives. So we don't have that. So for you to have that type of nuance, I think is fantastic because I agree with you in a way that, yes, it's real easy and no one wants to have the conversation that Alberto Salazar is one of the best American runners in distance of all time. He's he's, he's a very good runner. Um, again, a lot of people will say he wasn't very liked then, but he was competing. I don't think he really cared if he was liked. He was trying to win at all costs, even then, which is unfortunate. And I think he brought that into his coaching. And I think the, the you know the major disappointment, like you said, you learned a lot from him. And I think the major disappointment is he was a talented individual. He was a wealth of knowledge. He obviously had some coaching acumen because you can't just go and do the things he did without properly training some individuals. You can give individuals any type of you know drug, any type of whatever you want to give them. If there isn't some ability, if there isn't something to the training, then they're not going to become world champions. They're not going to compete at a high world level like that. So it's it's I think it's an unfortunate thing. It's obviously, again... It's fair criticism, it, you know, in a weird way. You know, I hate saying this, but he almost got what he deserved in a sense. But at the same time, it's tragic because there's a guy that really could have been an amazing American influence for American distance running. And now he's one of the biggest villains on the planet in terms of running. So it yeah, is really important. I appreciate I mean, your nuance, though. Yeah, I mean, you know, to be frank, he's the person who showed me the import of having runners do strength conditioning work, um, being very cognizant of sleep and nutrition. I mean, in a lot of ways, he was a really foundational and positive influence on expanding my worldview of running and coaching beyond just the scope of how many miles you're running and how fast is the pace, which is very, very common and very, very much the you know, boundaries of most people's worldview of training and coaching, mm -hmm. distance runners, middle distance runners. So I owe a debt of gratitude in that regard. But at the same time, too, like I said, I saw, I saw firsthand him say and do face some nasty things to athletes he was working with. And, you know, it just created, a, 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 like I said, a very mixed taste in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> So one thing I do have to ask you before we jump on here, because we were talking about training athletes. We were kind of talking about training athletes as like athlete A, athlete B. But, uh, you know, you coach both men and women, correct? Correct. Yeah. So there is a difference between coaching men and women in terms of these types of sports. When you're approaching men and women, uh, what is a different way that you approach their training and their aspect and in terms of how you go about training them? Because, I mean, the proof that there is a difference is kind of the times that we see a lot of the men and women run, right? There's You can do similar things, but obviously there's some things you have to change biologically with the, you know, men's gait versus women gait, stride rolling, things like that. So what what is your approach 
in terms of when you're dealing with the man versus a woman and how you go about training each of them? A lot of it is understanding, um, again, contextualizing in the worldview of where they're coming from and at what age they're coming from, right? So, like, you know, a woman essentially in America has, you know, I think it's something I've heard about 3,000 to 5,000 uh, indirect messages broadcasted to them every day that they're insufficient in some way. Uh, typically, you know, the ma American male, if he's white, does not have that. If he's a, a male of color, there's a, a different um, broadcasting and interpretation and stress that comes with that in America. So, you know, first and foremost, you have to create a safe space for those people and those athletes. And then you also have to, you know, understand like, yeah, we can't have, um, you know, necessarily like complete, total, flat uh, equality across the board, but we can be equitable with what we're doing and give the right amount of something to this person or that person or this or that. And the tough part is, you know, people, especially younger people, when we're working with younger athletes, as I'm sure you know, their biggest currency is attention. So that they they track the amount of time you're spending, especially the more intelligent, enlightened, and evolved women, they will keep a running tab on like, okay, you spent five minutes with Susie, 10 minutes with Shelby, eight minutes with Anna, nine minutes with me, and then interpret that as a hierarchy of you know, who your quote unquote favorite is, right? And I've had that many times where we're in the collegiate level, uh, you know, I'd be accused by a female uh, athlete of like, oh, you play favorites. I go, what? No way. And then they would give me their interpretation of how they came to that conclusion. I go, I could see how, you know, and I'd validate her interpretation. I could see how you could, you know, come to that conclusion with that outlook. But the reality is, this is not the case. I'm here to tell you that straight up. But, you know, it's hard because, at the end of the day, we're coaching people and people are social creatures because the hard wiring of this all is about neurochemicals, right? Dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all these hormones and chemicals, these positive ones that we want released. So in order to get that is really a driver is before we even talk about the X's and O's of training of, yeah, women need to do a little bit more strength and conditioning work because they lack, you know, relative to men gross muscle tissue power, but also too, women need to do a little bit more like longer aerobic work because they generally have more fat on their um, frame that they can utilize to their advantage as a clean fuel source. But then accessing that pathway, that chemical pathway needs to be a little bit more trained because it's not the most, you know, fluent one that's readily available to us. And then men, yeah, they need to do a little bit more power and explosive work, even for distance runners because of the mTOR, enzyme signaling and positive, you know, anabolic hormone release that they're going to get of testosterone from doing that stuff. That's going to help them recover quicker, make them feel better, this and that, right? So again, it's understanding all those, um, what I call local and global realities, right? The global realities of what globally, you know, men and women need and the biological differences, but also locally within who you're coaching, the um, context you're coaching and the people you're trying to interact with. It's kind of, again, you have to hold multiple things in your head at once to be able to like deliver the best service to that athlete possible. Man, I have gotten such an education just by talking to you today, Jonathan. This has been uh, you know, every I came into this, I saw a lot of what you did, and I thought this was going to be a great and educational podcast, but it's gone above and beyond. Oh, Jonathan, cool. thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, Alex, dude, thank you, man. Thanks for asking really, really, really astute questions. I appreciate it. I do what I can. So, again, he's Jonathan J. Marcus, um, obviously a fantastic coach and co host of the On Coaching podcast. Um, give us uh, where can people find the On Coaching podcast? Anything else that you would like to promote before we jump on out of here? Yeah, I mean, you can find the On Coaching Podcast on, you know, Spotify, you know, Apple, iPod, you know, whatever. Um, Science of Running, Steve Magnus' thing. Um, you know, sign, best, best way to get it is just sign up for the email and we'll drop an email every time I release it. And then two, you know, the thing that Magnus and I have built is what we call the Running Scholar Program, which is essentially a cohort of, you know, running nerds who are just looking at, like we talked about today, all the nuances that go into training and distance running, the history um, we have a, what we call a clubhouse, which is essentially like an online chat room with multiple channels, not really a forum. Think of it more like uh, an AIM or it's actually like a Discord server. People are familiar with that. Um, but like, there's always a wealth of information going on there. Coaches asking like, hey, I'm coaching middle schoolers for the first time. What do I do? Or 
I have this issue with the high school and IT band. And then all of a sudden you get like five or 10 different coaches. I mean, we're talking some of the best coaches in the U S and also internationally at various junior and national and senior levels, as well as brand new coaches all intersecting. So it's a pretty cool digital hangout. Like, I can't tell you, Alex, like how cool it is to live in an era where we can use these toys and these tools and technology to like communicate, converse and interact like this versus just, you know, uh, waiting until we all got to attract me and hopefully running to each other at a coffee shop or a bar. So, I mean, it's it's a great time to be alive. So I encourage people to look into the Running Scholar program and sign up for it. Steve and I charge about a buck a day for it, which is pennies on the dollar. Because the more important thing is rather than making them buck is making sure the message and community grows stronger and spreads. That's awesome. And yeah, so basically what you described with that kind of form is a much less toxic version of the let's run. Uh, <laughs> I, I try to say it's not at all. I mean, I mean, <laughs> it may be one of it, let's run. Like they were gold in the early 2000s. Like they were total gold um, back then. But yeah, now it's just, yeah. We had we had Jonathan Galt on a few weeks ago who, you know, I love his writing. I think he's one of the more underrated sports writers in general. I love Jonathan. Yeah, but, he hustles, know, man. I appreciate his hustle. Yeah. He's fantastic. And yeah, but you know, you know, everyone knows the Let's Run Forum is kind of let don't let the Let's Run Forum speak for the Let's Run website. <laughs> That's a, a, n- a nice way to put it there because the website still is a good wealth of knowledge for running. But again, thank you so much for coming on, uh, Jonathan. This was fantastic. If you're a coach, I hope you got a lot out of this because you can learn a lot from listening to people like uh, Jonathan. If you're an athlete, you know, if you're an elite athlete, get in touch with Jonathan. If you want to be pushed and you want to be great and you want to uh, achieve your maximum potential, he's the guy to do it. So again, this is the Talking to Novels podcast. I really appreciate everyone listening. Um, everyone, so long. <laughs>